Uh, well, Jonathan, uh, disingenuously uh, avoided what I was saying by pretending to agree with me, so he didn't have to take up my substantive points, uh, and then put his own views forward. Just a couple of points to make it absolutely clear where we do disagree. I argue there are not natural limits. This whole idea that there's a natural limit to the growth we can have, uh, and we can't go any further because of the biocapacity of the planet. I would argue, and I haven't got time to expand here, is utter nonsense. But that was a point I was making in relation to climate change. But it's not a question of holding back. It's a question of becoming more prosperous and going forward and having more growth because that's the best way to tackle climate change. So it's not a fixed limit. It's something we can overcome. In relation to poverty, my conception in relation to the third world is to aspire for the third world to be as rich as the West. Whereas the mainstream conception is just maybe to alleviate very slightly the worst edges of poverty. They certainly don't believe in Ferraris for all. They don't believe that everyone in China, for example, has the right to have a car, which I certainly do. You will also have noticed, if you listen carefully, Jonathan contradicted himself. Because at the very beginning, he acknowledged, quite rightly in fact, that his view is the orthodox one. And then later on, he claimed to be unorthodox. His is the orthodox one. <clears throat> What's really being put forward by Jonathan is a completely elitist perspective. You know, it's not only that he is the honourable Sir Jonathan Porritt, CBE or MBE, I forget which of his, I was confused, his bizarre honours in the British honour system, but the very much the dominant view of the elite, and I include in this people like Prince Charles, also the British government who uh, put Jonathan in charge of their Sustainable Development Commission for 10 years. Their view really is that they're very pessimistic about growth, they're very pessimistic about the prospects for increasing consumption. So they want to protect what they see as the limited resources in the world for themselves. It's really a form of protectionism. That's really what green politics is all about. It's saying, we the elite, we want to control the limited resources in the world. Popular consumption for them. Ordinary people in China having a Ferrari. Ordinary people in Britain having a flat screen television. That's really despicable. You know, it's very, very common for environmentalists to really talk about, oh, these terrible people who go to stag do's in Prague on Ryanair. This is really, really despicable. But when it comes to really fancy eco-holidays, for example, they're really into it. I noticed Jonathan, I read in the Telegraph, he recently went to the Maldives to a very exclusive uh, resort, talking about exclusive uh, eco-holidays for the likes of Madonna and Paul McCartney, you know, really wealthy people. They can go to an exotic eco-holiday in this exclusive resort in the Indian, Indian Ocean Island. But when ordinary people want to fly Ryanair or they want to fly EasyJet, that's really despicable. When ordinary people want to go and buy stuff in Asda or Tesco's, they see that as really problematic. It's okay for them to go to Waitrose and buy Dutch Originals biscuits, overpriced biscuits, that's perfectly okay. So I would argue there is a really strong elitist undercurrent to green thinking. And that is why the government, the United Nations, all these international organisations are very, very keen to sponsor it. Because they're trying to tell people, don't aspire to more, don't aspire to be prosperous, don't try to better yourselves, don't really aspire to having a, a richer kind of life. It's a really kind of elitist, anti-popular, anti-human argument. And the more clearly that comes out in the debate, the better. Thank you, Daniel. Jonathan, sorry, my name is Thank you. <laughs> nice to see your prejudices out and about, uh, <laughs> Daniel. I won't trade personal insults, as I'm sure you wouldn't want to go that way. The, um, the real story that is absolutely fascinating listening to that is I don't believe in natural limits. As if this was a sort of theory, a bit like religion, and you can either choose to believe in these natural limits or not to believe in them. Now this is not a sound basis on which to get to grips with how natural systems work. You, I'm sure we'd all understand that if you overwork a piece of land for many, many years, you will degrade its fertility to the point where it no longer produces any food for us. There is a limit in the natural fertility capabilities of any area of land. And if you overstretch the limit, as happened with the Dust Bowl, the land collapses. The fertility of the land collapses. 
We are bounded on every side by natural limits to what we can do. It's completely ridiculous to ignore them. It's like saying, no, I really don't think that any of these limits are going to impact on our life. It leads to this kind of fantastical cornucopianism, just says, ignore it, get richer at any cost, keep on getting richer, and then we'll sort it out. So I'm sorry about that, because if you can't have a properly science, a proper science-based discussion about this, it is quite difficult to know where to take it. And an ideological swatting away of the concept of biophysical limits is not likely to be very helpful to sensible decision making. And that is why governments are around the world, not for the paranoid elitist reasons that Daniel has itemized this evening. That is why governments have progressively committed themselves to finding ways of creating wealth and prosperity within those natural limits. Not by ignoring them, but creating wealth within those limits. So yes, it's true that one of the best responses to the build-up of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere is to go hell for leather for low-carbon technologies, which would enable us to enjoy the energy services that we currently derive from fossil fuels without the externality, without the build-up of the gases in the atmosphere. And most Greens, I know this really upsets Danny because he'd love to paint us all into a box of sort of absolutist, no-growthists, who basically want to take you all back to a primitive life where you can huddle around fires and have a miserable time. Not nothing to do with the Green Movement, but I don't think Daniel knows very much about the Green Movement. Most environmentalists today are so excited about the idea of driving this low-carbon revolution, about bringing in these new technologies, using solar power, forget nuclear, bringing on all these new technologies to deliver this low-carbon, prosperous world. You will not find the Green Movement characterized by people who want to go straight from here to zero growth. They want to question the nature of growth. They are indeed growth skeptic, given the externalities of much of that growth. But the old school of anti-growth, zero growth, that existed in the 70s and early 80s, you don't hear much of that these days. And that probably upsets Daniel, because he'd like that straw man above everything else to go on poking his lance at. Actually, most environmentalists today are pretty keen on the technology revolution that is available to us. We want to see this innovation driven really hard, purposefully, by governments, with a clear sense of what low carbon prosperity actually looks like. Mm-hmm. So you have to unpick a lot of these fantasies that Daniel has on two counts. One, what the Green Movement is, or rather what he'd like you to believe it is, and two, what the planet will or will not allow us to do and whether or not we can assume that there are no natural limits which constrain us like they constrain every other, <coughs> every other species. So I suppose, really, you've got a choice here. You can go with a, a crazy, zany form of economic cornucopianism that is detached from science, or you can try and work out what prosperity looks like based on the best science available to us today. That's really what the choice is. Thank you, Jonathan.